this month on In the Life. The legacy of AIDS. In 1996, protease inhibitors revolutionized both treatment and activism. My particular price tag is $47,000 a year. While in Mexico, an impoverished community struggled for health care. There might be more of it, but we depend on people dying. Amidst the crisis, we refuse to let our art die. And one positive man whose HIV has transformed his art. All this and more on In the Life, America's gay and lesbian news magazine. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation, the Gill Foundation, the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, the Overbrook Foundation, the Ted Snowden Foundation, and the annual support of In the Life members like you. Down Christopher Street, Thousands March with quiet reverence to honor the dead and to support the living. Hello, this is Ricky. This is my student at the Kashi Ashram, and he died just a few while ago. See all my brothers and sisters here, you know, and remembering all the people who have died of this incredible disease, you know. This is uh, my former lover, Gary C., who died in October of 1989. My name is Jeffrey Garrett. I'm from Washington, D.C., and this is kind of an act of closure for me. I'm a volunteer, and we came from Atlanta to carry a sign for this man whose name is Bob. I don't know him but I'm very honored to be a volunteer to do this today. They're friends of mine, and these are my students. They're all my students. Every one of them are dead, more and hundreds more than this. This is Dennis Riley. He was 40 years old, and I was a volunteer with him through the Buddy program, and I helped him through his last year of life. My name is Ed Ditterline, and this is John Perkins. We were lovers for 18 years. He died three days ago, and I'm really very sad. Welcome to In the Life, The Legacy of AIDS, a portrait of the epidemic in the 90s. I'm Bill Brachtrup. In 1981, when AIDS first hit the national radar, it was known as the gay cancer, or GRID, gay-related immune deficiency. And while Ronald Reagan refused to say the word AIDS until seven years into his presidency, AIDS activism sprung up within a wounded gay and lesbian community. In the late 80s, activists rallied for access to medications and struggled to end discrimination against people with AIDS. By the 90s, gays and lesbians had mobilized for visibility, for representation, and for survival. Tonight, In the Life reflects upon the intricate legacy of AIDS. As Tijuana relies on the U.S. for inherited medication, one man leads the battle against the black AIDS epidemic from the inner city. There's a crisis going on, uh, and we need to do something about it. And in outtakes, Harvey Firestein questions what AIDS activism has really achieved. Why are we still doing this? Has nothing changed in the last 15 years? But first, in 1996, protease inhibitors changed the face of AIDS. By stopping HIV-infected cells from reproducing, protease combined with older drugs like AZT to create a pill cocktail that helped control the virus. But longer lifespans in the U.S. began to threaten health care south of the border, and protease couldn't do anything to address the social problems at the heart of the epidemic. Rock Hudson, Eddie Peterson, Cindy Gerando. Thornton Wells. So many names, so many quilts. We may remember 1996 as the last year this mall could hold them all, but it also was a year of hope for some people still living with AIDS. Vancouver, Canada, the 11th International Conference on AIDS. 
No big breakthroughs, but a major advance in AIDS therapy, the so-called pharmaceutical cocktail, a mixture of drugs, old and new, that for some patients seems to work. We are seeing incredible results in terms of these drugs bringing down the level of virus in the body and also keeping patients alive uh, healthier and longer. The therapy combines two older drugs like AZT or 3TC that prevent healthy cells from becoming infected with a new class of drugs called protease inhibitors that stop already infected cells from producing new HIV. So the rationale is if we take both of those drugs in combination, both nucleoside analogs and protease inhibitors, you're basically blocking HIV production uh, from two sides. I can't describe the, the boost and the rush I got in the month after starting the, uh, the protease inhibitors. For John Hatchett, 1996 is ending a lot better than it began. Last December, hospitalized for bacterial meningitis and a reoccurrence of lymphoma, he began six months of intensive chemotherapy. I was sick as a dog. I lost 15 pounds. Um, I was on constant IV antibiotics for most of the holidays. Um, and then in early January, probably related to the chemo, had severe anemia, collapsed here, did the whole ambulance back to the hospital trip. I stopped working. I resigned from my job. It really felt to me like I, I was entering some kind of last few years, last couple of years. I thought maybe two at the most. Mentally, emotionally, you were preparing yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. In March, John developed cryptosporidiosis, which did not respond to treatment. He continued to go downhill. In May, with some skepticism, he began the new combination therapy. Within two and a half weeks after adding the protease, my cryptosporidium symptoms stopped completely. Um, I mean, literally one day they were there, the next day they were gone. I could feel day to day an improvement in my strength, in my energy level. My sex drive started to come back. In June, John Hatchett headed for Vancouver, the virus now undetectable in his blood. What was it like to be in Vancouver and hear all these encouraging medical reports? and realized they were talking about you. Indeed, I, there were several times when I wanted to jump up from my seat and, you know, you're right, yes, 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 this is happening, I'm proof, you know. Um, and I, frankly, it, the only sort of damper on that was just knowing personally of people who were not having the kind of response I was. Some people um, have such serious side effects that they can't take them and others um, simply don't respond to the drugs in the way that one hopes. They're, difficult to use also. Um, the one I'm on, for example, has to be taken on a particular schedule in relation to food, so you have to adjust your eating schedule around that. And no one can say for sure how long the new drug therapies will work, or even if the clinical results tell the whole story. We see that uh, these cocktails bring down the level of virus in the blood dramatically. But we need to understand that only about 4% of the virus is actually in the blood. 96% uh, of it is in the lymph nodes and is in the gut and is in the brain, which are major reservoirs for HIV. Still, for many people with AIDS who would like to at least try protease inhibitors, there are more basic obstacles. My particular price tag is $47,000 a year for my combination of triple dose sequinavir, AZT, 3GC, acyclovir, and my other um, non-HIV medications. It costs tens of thousands of dollars a year to be on this, and most people simply cannot afford it. The other problem is access. Can people get it? And most of the people with HIV or AIDS cannot get these medicines, both in this country and around the world. Some people in developing countries cannot even afford aspirin uh, in this country alone. Um, because so many uh, patients with HIV and AIDS do rely on things like AIDS drug assistance programs and Medicaid. Uh, both of those programs that are available are still very iffy as to whether or not they do cover the protease inhibitors and whether or not they will cover all of these drugs in combination. And more critically, we're finding a real um, strong groundswell of opposition on the part of some components within the HIV AIDS community to making those drugs available to 
less privileged persons than themselves. Jean Bergman of New York's Housing Works. Her clients come from the African American and Latino communities, HIV positive, homeless, living in poverty. Some have drug addictions or suffer mental illness. People for whom taking medication on a strict regimen can be even more difficult. And the fear is that if the drugs aren't taken correctly, that new and mutant strains of HIV will de develop, which will further endanger the health of people who are already infected and also potentially pose a public health hazard. And that's become an excuse for denying um, protease inhibitors to large segments of the community that is already affected by and infected with HIV. Consider this prediction from the Harvard AIDS Institute. By the year 2000, more than half of all AIDS cases in the U.S. will be among African Americans. Okay, so how have you been? And AIDS is increasing most rapidly now among women. Yet clinical trial data on how women respond to the new drugs has been slow in coming. Protease has done a lot for us, but it hasn't done anything to the classism, sexism, racism, uh, homophobia that it have been so much a part of AIDS since the beginning. Um, and those are still our battles. They have to be. Otherwise, a purely medical, even a cure, is really not going to have meaning for most of the people with HIV in the world. Which brings us back to Washington, where during Quilt Weekend, hundreds of AIDS activists were confronting all these issues in different ways. A mock funeral at the White House. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that we've surrounded half of the building at this point. A human chain around the Capitol to demand more leadership from elected officials. More action now! We are. A demonstration against pharmaceutical companies and their drug prices. And the candlelight vigil. A lot of anger, a lot of emotion. At least for this day. But where does AIDS activism go from here? I think the big problem in, in much of AIDS activism right now is nobody knows where to focus. As treatment has changed, a lot of energy has gone in that direction, and yet the issues of access to treatment for so many people is really the key issue, and a lot of people are moving in that direction. And so there's a little, unfortunately, a little scatteredness to the activist movement right now. If you look at, it, say, ACT UP New York and find it smaller than it was a couple of years ago, it's because all those people have spread out to other agencies, other lobbying groups, and the work goes on in an activist way, but in different forms. So I see it getting savvier. I see people taking uh, advantage of all the technology, the email, the internet, the stuff like that, uh, trying to build better and stronger networks. I think what we'll find is a lot more linkages between activism around HIV and other illnesses and disabilities with activism around race and especially around poverty. Um, and welfare issues. Price gouging pharmaceuticals are one of our targets. Uh, needle exchange, pushing that is big, uh, and prevention. You know, in the long run, I'm going to be much better off. Respect yourself, protect yourself. The prevention message is still very homogenized. It's still very, it's, it's like glossy advertising. There is no urgency to it. People are getting infected still every day by the thousands. And at year's end, a look ahead to 1997. A realistic dream is that we have the president talking about this much more loudly and really helping the American people understand that there is still an emergency epidemic going on. I'm afraid I think the future is pretty grim. I think that with the consequences of the Welfare Act gradually filtering down, what we'll see is an increase in poverty and homelessness, an increase in HIV infection rates, as well as in other public health problems. For 1997, I would like to see that we can at least keep HIV a manageable infection, uh, manageable in the sense of diabetes, where you are never really officially cured of the disease, but you can complete, you can live a, you can live your life as healthy as possible. And for John Hatchett, there are dreams again. One of my fondest fantasies of myself in a year is living in Italy, with my lover, doing work similar to what I've done here. Uh, if I end up staying in New York, I see myself in a bigger apartment. That's it. And so, 15 years into the epidemic, AIDS continues to haunt us.
even as it inspires us with everyday examples of compassion and courage. But as hopes begin to rise for an ultimate cure, our greatest inspiration continues to come from those we have lost. For In the Life, I'm Hal German. One of the most effective tools in the fight against AIDS is having the right information, facts about prevention and treatment. If you want more information on AIDS in communities of color, contact the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS or the National Minority AIDS Council. For these and other links to organizations working in the battle against AIDS, check out our website at inthelifetv.org. This is Pamela Sneed for In the Life. Many Americans come to Tijuana for sex, provided by men and women who sell their bodies, perhaps to feed a family or sometimes to feed a drug habit. So much of the AIDS that we have down here can be attributed to Americans coming from California into this region uh, and uh, engaging in sexual, you know, utilizing the services of the sex industry down here, which is a major industry in Tijuana. Fred Scholl works as the volunteer pharmacologist at Aquacita, or Alliance Against AIDS, an AIDS outpatient clinic in Tijuana run by gay activists. Aquacita was started in October 1989. For eight years, it has been the only HIV clinic in Tijuana. It has never closed. Currently, only 15% of Aquacita clients are gay men. 40% of the clients are heterosexual couples. But a closer look at Mexican culture may explain this trend. A much higher percentage of men in Mexico have bisexual experiences than in the United States. And of course, that contributes to the AIDS situation because men can get infected with HIV and take it home to their wives. And that's a common scenario here. No matter how people get infected with the HIV virus, getting treatment for any Mexican citizen always depends on access to money. If the person has money, they can get treated in the United States. Or they can pay a private doctor who will charge a lot of money and may not help them as much because doctors here are not up to par with the latest treatments. People without the financial means, the working class who go to the general hospital, are referred to government offices. And from there, they send them here, to us. Acocita is the only clinic in Mexico that provides AIDS drugs to its patients free of charge. Drugs that are brought here from San Diego and elsewhere in the United States. I essentially, through a network in San Diego and throughout a chunk of the United States, collect medicines and medical supplies that would normally be thrown away and bring them down here. Because of American laws, prescribed drugs that are no longer useful to a patient are usually thrown away. Let's say if I had AZT and I had a friend that needed AZT, and I gave that friend AZT in the U.S., I'd be committing a felony. Uh, if I donate it to a medical organization outside of the U.S., that's not violating the law. So what happens is this stuff is donated for use down here. Ironically, the supply of life-giving drugs to Akasita has depended on the death of Americans with AIDS. It might be more of it, but we depend on people dying for, for our medicines, or that their, their medicines are changed. And prior to the protease inhibitors, we were not only providing medicines to this clinic, but we were providing medicines to clinics in Mexicali and in Guadalajara and, and in Mexico City. Uh, we had lots of medicines, and then all of a sudden they dried up because people were living. And I've worked with AIDS long enough that we have kind of a, oh, we've developed a jaded attitude. We have seen every wonder cure. You know, AZT was it, and then there was DDI, and then there was this, and then there was 3TC. Every one of those things have come along, and the virus has a way of adjusting. So we, we said, if things go the way they always have, we might have about six months and people are going to start dying again. And you know what? That's happened. The studies have shown only about 50% of the people taking the protease inhibitors that it works with. The other 50% it doesn't. And so now we're getting a good supply again. With a budget of just $12,000 a year and an all-volunteer staff, 
The clinic can only see patients once a week and has endured many hardships. For a couple of years, we had no running water, and a lot of times we have had electrical problems. It really narrows down to a lot of priorities. You know, this is why we don't have a, a cell telephone. This is why we don't have a, the latest technology in computers. This is why we don't have a lot of, you know, modern facilities because we have to sort of make a budget throughout the year and then sort of live by. But volunteers at the clinic are fulfilled in other ways. It's important for me because there are lots of people that one day, I'm not sure it can happen to them, but tomorrow or the day after, it could happen to any of my kids or to me. This is important to me because I can help not only the institution, but the patients. While Akosito provides much needed help to the HIV community in Tijuana, the majority of those infected by the virus remain untreated. People with HIV are susceptible to tuberculosis, a disease that has hit epidemic proportions in Tijuana and is infecting more and more people across the border in San Diego as well. You have a combination of AIDS and TB working together, which has a synergistic effect. And if you don't deal with it here, you're going to deal with it over there. And they already are starting. So it's, it's just infectious diseases don't respect borders. This philosophy drives the work of many Americans and Mexicans who cross the border to fight AIDS. This is really just one big metro area divided by a fence, a fence put up by the US government. And it's a fence that runs right down the middle of my life. And I don't, uh, I don't have any less human feelings for people who live on this side of the fence than who live on the San Diego side of the fence. And I wish that more people in San Diego felt the same way. As far as me going up to different cities up, up in California and even Oregon, New York and, and in Canada and talking about what we do down here and giving them the literature, that has been very, very successful, you know, and I think that once they, they hear our story, our struggle down here, I, I think uh, the people will be able to help us out with the medication because, it's, it, you know, for us, it's more important to have the medication than, than to have millions of dollars. The Joint United Nations Program on AIDS, or UN AIDS, has worked since 1996 to provide resources and care around the world. But impoverished and developing nations contain the vast majority of AIDS cases, 28 and a half million in sub-Saharan Africa alone. That's over 70% of the people living with the virus today. Still to come on In the Life. Artists build a visual memory of the AIDS crisis. And before Harvey Firestein acts up about AIDS activism, I may be ready to join those nutcases who claim HIV does not spread AIDS. A campaign against the virus in the inner city. Today, there are almost one million people infected with HIV and AIDS in North America. And although the virus alone may not discriminate, Access to AIDS education and treatment is often restricted by race and class status. That may be changing in the Pico Union District of Los Angeles. There's a huge AIDS crisis for the African American community. 62% of all women with AIDS are black. 40% of all men with AIDS are black. Now, when you have prevalence rates and incidence rates among young black men that are going through the roof, uh, yeah, there's a crisis going on. Uh, and we need to do something about it. And the we you now is both the gay community and you know, the African American community. We all need to do something about it. In 1999, Phil Wilson mobilized a group of colleagues to look at the epidemic in a systematic way. And the African American AIDS Policy and Training Institute was formed. 
The Institute is the only black HIV AIDS think tank in the country. We train people in the basic science of AIDS. We train people in organizational development. We train people in prevention and policy. Uh, we disseminate information through a number of ways, through a newsletter, through a website, uh, through events, from what we call a uniquely and unapologetically uh, black point of view. The motto of the organization is our people, our problem, our solution. And what that means is that we do things for us, by us. We believe that within the black community, you know, nothing's going to happen unless we start to take action and responsibility for that. The Institute is located in one of the hardest hit parts of Los Angeles, the Pico Union District, the epicenter of the epidemic. We have people who are Korean, uh, we have Latinos, we have African Americans. Also, this is one of the places from which folks who were incarcerated are released. There's also sex workers who work here, and um, there is an, an, a large number of substance use going on around here as well. Despite the AIDS crisis in the African American community, many activists believe that black organizations have been slow to develop an infrastructure dedicated to fighting the epidemic. If there weren't gay AIDS organizations, we would not have been as effective as we were in the gay community in fighting the disease. You know? And so you think we would have learned that if you want to deal with the disease among women or you want to deal with the disease among ethnic minorities, that there have to be in strong indigenous organizations to deal with those diseases in those communities. I think that there are always things that white organizations can bring into the black community. But I think ultimately for effective work to happen, black organizations need to be intimately involved in that process. While there is a call for black organizations to take action, many are hesitant to add AIDS programming to their agendas because they are already dealing with a host of other issues. The crisis in the African American community around HIV and AIDS is from a number of things. You know, part of it is still rooted in the history and the perception that AIDS was you know, a gay disease. Part of it is rooted in homophobia in black communities. The black institutions are still dealing with violence and you know, other health issues and unemployment issues and underemployment and infant mortality and civil rights issues. All of those things are still on the plate and so people have to juggle how they spend their time and, and the resources. The Institute's mission is to organize other black groups including civil rights organizations, churches, sororities and fraternities and assist them in developing HIV and AIDS education and treatment programs that can be incorporated into what they already do. This candlelight vigil in March, held in the Watts section of Los Angeles, is an example of the Institute's collaboration with faith-based, civil rights, and service organizations. People ask me what kind of motivated me to become an activist to the degree that, that I am. And part of it is race, and part of it is class, and part of it is you know, age and geography. I grew up in Chicago in the late 50s and throughout the 60s, and that was a time of lots of activities. You know, I was a young boy doing the Martin Luther King marches in Chicago, and my parents were actively engaged. I saw things that did not seem to me to be right. In 1980, I just come out. Uh, my partner and I went to the doctor, and our doctors talked to us about this thing that he had seen, and it involved gay men somehow, and it involved swollen lymph nodes, but he didn't know anything. And my partner and I said that our lymph nodes had been swollen for some time, and so the doctor took uh, a biopsy and discovered that our lymph nodes were abnormal, but he didn't know what that meant. Shortly after that, we moved to Los Angeles, and it became pretty obvious what was happening. Our friends were getting sick, and our friends were dying. If you were a person of conscience, you had to get involved. And so we got involved in the beginning days because we felt we needed to know. We felt that it was going to be about us. In the early 80s, AIDS was considered to be a gay, white male disease. Now, with the current staggering numbers of African Americans stricken with HIV and AIDS, there are concerns that racism has played a role in the epidemic. 
Racism particularly is a player in the HIV AIDS pandemic because race drives so many things in this country. There was a study that was released recently that showed if you are black, the quality of your HIV health care is less than if you are white, and, and that crosses class lines and geography uh, and, and insurance and employment and health status. In an effort to study the effects of HIV and AIDS as it affects communities of color, the Institute established Crossroads Medical, a Brooklyn, New York-based model program. Dr. Diana Williamson is its medical director. There is a major epidemic of HIV, but there's an epidemic within the epidemic, and that's an epidemic related to poverty. And the poverty is more important than the risk factors in terms of the body fluids. And people who are poor do things that they would not ordinarily do if they weren't hungry and if they weren't homeless. And that the social structure in the United States allows people who are poor to continue to have the burden of disease that we don't see in other social economic status uh, classes. And that is the root of it. It's not African Americans don't wear condoms. It's poor people in general don't wear condoms. On the flip side of that, it seems that there is a belief in parts of the gay community that this is no longer a gay issue. Uh, and for me, that's problematic on two fronts. It's problematic because clearly it is still a gay issue. Minimally, it's an issue among gay men of color. You know? And so either we're making a decision that gay men of color don't count, which is a concern that I have. But secondly, it's an issue for the gay community because in the early 80s and the mid 80s and the early 90s, we said that we were going to be involved in fighting this thing until it was over. You know, and I remember the posters that said, until there's a cure. You know, well, there's not a cure yet, and it's not over, and we have you know, a commitment, a promise uh, that we have to keep. For an activist, fighting the AIDS crisis is not only challenging, it's life-consuming. And for Phil, this battle is deeply personal. Part of the challenge in doing this work is trying to have a life. So being at home is really important also. At home involves, you know, spending time with my nephews. My uncle's being gay and having AIDS, that's, that's not an issue for me because, you know, we family and we stick together, we love each other no matter what, you know. And I keep my uncle healthy and, you know, he keeps me healthy, we keep each other going. And I'm convinced that particularly in addressing HIV and AIDS with young people, we're not going to get there just by AIDS 101 stuff and teaching about prevention and teaching about treatment. I think we're going to get there, at least with black youth, in finding ways to get young people to think about their lives, which will influence the choices that they make and will determine whether or not they put themselves at risk or not. Well, I've been extremely privileged in that people talk to me and they think that the work that we do here has touched their lives. And so I, I have people who write me or call me and say, I saw you do you know, a speech or I saw something you wrote. I speak with people regularly who have decided to reconcile relationships with their families. You know, I've, speak, I've spoken to people who say that they reclaim their churches. I mean, that is like really a remarkable thing to have happened to you. Um, and I'm grateful for that. Over the past 20 years, AIDS has left gaping holes in just about every artistic community. We have lost artists, and we have risk losing their art, art that preserves memories as artifacts from inside the epidemic. But a series of groups have organized to rescue the work and the memories that these artists have created. Jack Waters is a New York-based filmmaker, writer, and dancer who was diagnosed with HIV in 1992. In honor of Gay Pride this past summer, New York City's Donald Library commissioned Waters and his partner, Peter Kramer, to install their exhibit called Pride 2001 in a window of the library. It's a uh, three-channel video installation and uh, photographs that are my photographs and also 
archival material from various gay and lesbian publications. So what we were working on conceptually was the idea of AIDS and AIDS history, but especially about how it's become erased from the popular consciousness. To assist artists like Jack Waters, the advocacy group Alliance for the Arts founded the Estate Project for Artists with AIDS in 1991. It was founded to assist families and survivors to, in preserving the work uh, of artists that were being directly affected by the, by the epidemic. And artists in the broadest sense, uh, performing arts, visual arts, literature, uh, dance, filmmaking, etc. Jack Waters is one of the artists whose films we've had the opportunity to, uh, to preserve and master in the film preservation program. Jack, are you there? Jackie, Jackie, are you there? I have Jack. been active in the AIDS oh. HIV movement since the mid-80s, since my friends started getting sick and dying. Getting an HIV diagnosis is a major life change. And being an artist, of course, it changes the way one approaches one's art. For me, in retrospect, I would say that the thing that's really changed the most um, as being uh, HIV positive and diagnosed with AIDS is this idea that there's not that much time. Let me try and explain the impetus for starting the estate project for artists with AIDS. A lot of people in society were um, reeling at that time in the early 90s from the cumulative impact of AIDS. And in the midst of all of that, we in the arts became aware of uh, what we understood as a secondary loss. The first loss was, of course, of people. But we began to realize that when those people were artists, they, there was a double loss. The art itself that they created, their most personal and lasting expression, was um, uh, cut off because of the shortness of their lives. And of course, in many of those cases, that, that the subject of that work became AIDS and, uh, itself, or the epidemic, or death, or mortality itself, which certainly would not have been the case if they had lived a normal lifespan. Currently, the focus of the estate project is primarily archival. They have launched the online virtual collection in partnership with Visual Aids, the only national organization that provides direct services to HIV-positive visual artists and documents their work in the largest archive of its kind. In addition, the Estate Project has archives for dance and musical works in the making, work that in many cases would have otherwise been lost. I've known and known of many artists who have died of AIDS before they've had an opportunity to make plans for their artwork after they've died. When that has happened, many times the, there develop tremendous fights between gallery owners and, and family members as who has the rights to the work. And as a result of that, um, the tragic result of that is that oftentimes the work gets lost, it gets discarded, it gets held up in litigation, it gets, well, it dies. As the culmination of its first decade of work, the Estate Project produced Loss Within Loss, which was edited by prominent out gay writer Edmund White, who is himself HIV positive. Uh, Loss Within Loss is a subtitle The Artist in the Age of AIDS, and it's a collection of essays by various people about those in the arts who have died of AIDS. A lot of the essays are about artists who were not known. In general, if, if the artists whom we know and revere had died before age 40, we would never have heard of their names. And so we have the beginnings of careers and the beginnings of reputations, but the danger of these people being forgotten entirely. One of the contributors to Loss Within Loss is writer and activist Sarah Shulman. Well, you know, I think there was a dominant aesthetic to AIDS art at a certain era, the end of the 80s. The chaos, the panic, the sadness, the desperation that you see in AIDS art that's made right at the height of the crisis. Work that's not finished, that's sloppy, that's a mess because the people are a mess, because everyone's upset, because no one knows what to do. In a sense, formally, that is the most authentic representation of the emotion. AIDS certainly brought about a, an interest in the two great themes of human existence, uh, love 
and death. And I think it was remarkable that there was that kind of serious focus that was suddenly brought to these two subjects in the gay community, because the gay community, like the rest of America, uh, was sort of almost too jokey to talk about love and, and death phobic. So uh, it, it, it took something as extraordinary as, as AIDS to uh, finally break this taboo. The publication of Loss Within Loss, which marks the 10th anniversary of the estate project, also coincides with another anniversary. In 2001, GMHC, or Gay Men's Health Crisis, turns 20. GMHC was founded in New York City in 1981 by a group of gay men as the first organization in the world to fight AIDS. As a reminder of the contributions that artists have made to the struggle against AIDS, GMHC commissioned an art exhibit at the Museum of the City of New York this past summer. The, the show is a, is, a variety, is a collection of a variety of objects. You have from posters to photographs to personal mementos that, momentums that people have had to um, critical announcements and press releases. The initial art that we remember is art by white male artists. It is not the case throughout the epidemic as it unfortunately evolved and continued to expanding into other communities. So did the artists' works, you know? Artists from all communities, black artists, Latino artists, women, have participated, produced, and continue to this day to do that. AIDS, A Living Archive, is based on a documentary project. Its two curators, Jane Rosette and Jean Carlomusto, have worked on the exhibit for five years. A lot of what, what Jean and I are doing is exploring that and sort of, and something actually, you know, sort of the relationship between what happens when you create activist propaganda and means of communication, and then it becomes, that very, that very piece becomes um, a document, and then it becomes an artifact, and then it's seen as art. The direct consequences of AIDS, the suffering and death of artists of every discipline, left its mark on the art of the 80s and 90s. But even if a cure were found tomorrow, the impact of AIDS on the arts will be felt for decades to come. Now we have a generation of people my age who have had a profound experience of, with death and in great quantity. And here we are, middle-aged, facing the second halves of our lives. And I think that we do all of that very differently than we would have without that loss that came before. And the way that that aging will be represented in the artwork that we make will always be determined by the experiences that we had at the height of the AIDS crisis. When Howard Ashman and I were working on Beauty and the Beast, he was HIV positive and was very concerned about people finding out about his health status. And so he held off as long as possible until he finally had to let people know. Um, despite his concerns, Disney was wonderful. And they sent producers and directors and animators and people to a hotel near Howard's house and worked with him every second they possibly could until, until he was gone. Through Beauty and the Beast, I was involved in a watershed moment when Bill, Howard's partner, accompanied me on stage and accepted the Oscars for Howard. I'm Alan Menken, and you're watching In the Life. For any visual artist, the loss of sight is a terrifying prospect. But that's exactly what happened to John Dugdale at the height of his career as one of the world's most sought-after commercial photographers. Dugdale was 34 when AIDS-related illnesses left him partially paralyzed and legally blind. But Dugdale was determined to pursue his art, even against overwhelming odds. The result? A new photographic genre that has critics talking and museums scrambling. What attracted art directors and editors worldwide to Dugdale's work was his uniquely sincere but sensual style, which evoked the work of 19th century photography pioneers like Julia Margaret Cameron and Henry Fox Talbot. I really imitated what I thought 19th century photography looked like, and I did very saturated, deep, old-fashioned colors, and I, I really, it really ran the gamut from shoe catalogs for Ralph Lauren to pizza pictures for McCall's. In the high-tech days of the early 90s, Dugdale vowed never to touch a computer, and so far, never has. Dugdale's love of all things 19th century was more than a hobby, it became a way of life. I had a wonderful experience for about eight years of living in a house 
that had no modern um, amenities whatsoever and was the most quiet house I'd ever been in. It was easy to find the past here, you know, shards of pottery from a hundred different decades coming up from under the ground every time I made the garden. Making more of a sense of the 19th century here at the house, the first thing I did was rip everything out of the house that was, bef you know, post-1875, which was the latest addition to the house. And um, some of the wiring was kind of dangerous, and it was very old and gave me the excuse to take out some of it, which then led to me taking out all of it, which then led to me removing all of the appliances, including the heat. As his commercial career skyrocketed, Doug Dale's increasingly harried life was complicated further in 1993 when he learned he was HIV positive. I thought I would be asymptomatic forever, but, um, you know, I, I thought, well, I'm a healthy boy, I don't do drugs, I don't drink, I go to bed early, I pray, I spend a lot of time in the country. What I didn't really understand was the main factor in so much illness of any kind, HIV or not, is stress and I had untold stress in my life. I believe it was the late winter of, uh, the winter of 93, 94, so the, 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 the late winter when, he, ha when he, had a, he had a stroke and a very serious one. He was hospitalized, I believe, for four months. CMV retinitis came, I believe, in May. He lost 80% of his sight in a 30-day period. Like Robert Maplethorpe, Keith Haring, and other artists in the early 90s, Doug Dale's brush with mortality brought a sense of urgency to his work. We've had political art, you know, from the 60s on that, that was um, very powerful and important, but I think AIDS turned that, that sort of more general protest kind of art into something much more personal, especially because it involves sex and the body. Many artists took a confrontational style in dealing with the epidemic, creating angry activist art. Dugdale's approach, however, stripped the stigma from sex, death, loss, and love, and presented them in photographs which could have been taken 100 years ago. The timelessness has something to do with John's technique. Um, he's working in a 19th century technique. He's reviving a lot of looks and styles that, that come from the past, um, and clearly wants to place his work and his subjects in a time that's that's really hard to pin down. I think John would cringe to have someone in front of his camera with clothes on. It creates so many complexities of fashion, and, and uh, it would create a very specific time for the photograph of his work. It tends to be very timeless. His lighting is mostly natural light. It's the kind of light you would get in an 18th century farmhouse. It's the light coming from the window, which is the most beautiful kind of light. It's not the kind of st strobe, glossy, glitzy light. It's a very subtle, contemplative light. It's a, uh, where the shadows have their own life. It's, that's perfect, James. Though critics will debate the meaning of Doug Dale's technique, his signature style actually emerged when his needs as an HIV-positive artist intersected with his knowledge of 19th century photography. Okay. Being a student of the past, when I came out of the hospital, I knew that I wouldn't be able to use the normal, fairly toxic chemistry that comes in the normal black and white darkroom process. But I did know about cyanotypes, which are made in, you know, in ultraviolet light in the sun. Um, it's a pre-electric process from 1841 invented by an astronomer and a philosopher named Sir John Herschel. The most simple formula for it is two iron salts mixed together in water, brushed on a piece of archival paper, and sandwiched together with one of the large format negatives, exposed to the light of the sun, and rinsed in water. That's it. There's no darkroom involved. You can do them outside in the yard. Ironically, Doug Dale's return after his diagnosis to more personal and substantial work has catapulted him into the realm of art world superstar, earning him greater success and respect than his commercial career ever could. He talks a lot about his condition, that it was preordained, and that it was all destined, 
There's, there's no sadness in that. Uh, there's no regret. If I had one thing to tell any artist in any medium to do while, while they were sick, after they were sick, before, doing, after, any time, is to take their experience and channel it through their filter of whatever their medium is and use their talent to possess the thing that's happening to you. And finally, shortly after In the Life's Own, Harvey Firestein went back to Broadway for Hairspray, he started to question how he has spent the last 20 years of his life. As you may know, I'm back on Broadway. That's right, these shaved eyebrows are not meant as a fashion statement. Well, no sooner had I arrived in my dressing room than the request to perform AIDS benefits began to pile up. Nothing new about that, I do AIDS benefits all the time. But the sheer number of requests started me thinking, why are we still doing this? Has nothing changed in the last 15 years? And if not, why not? Have we wasted two decades battling the wrong cause of AIDS? For the better part of the last 20 years, my friends and I have sacrificed time, energy, and resources to the crisis. We've raised money, performed shows, spoken out at schools, on TV, at rallies, in movies, hospital wards, street corners. We've marched and protested and screamed ourselves hoarse. <clears throat> We've sought out experts, trained the counselors, built hospital wards, created hospices, handheld patients, counseled families, and sewn memorial quilt panels in every city of every state of this nation. We've backroomed politicians and bullied pulpits, lambasted school boards and blackballed bigots. We've written legislation and pamphlets and found funding for prevention. We fought court battles and took on drug companies. We've smuggled meds, phonied insurance forms, bribed health care workers to get what patients needed. We've lectured and written about our experiences. We've buried our friends and our lovers and our family members and our neighbors. We've passed out condoms and rubbered bananas and worn red ribbons to every public event imaginable. We've held world events and outmediated every single other disease ever contracted by man or beast. We've spread the message in all conceivable languages that AIDS is a deadly but difficult to contract and completely preventable disease. We've done all this for the better part of 20 years and still AIDS is a day-to-day -day reality in our community. Am I alone in feeling like a political fool, a social fossil, and a community failure? I know folks who think that being HIV positive is cool, sexy, and desirable. I know HIV positive people who have unprotected sex with others without care or conscience. I know HIV positive people who only have unprotected sex. I know HIV negative people who only have unprotected sex. I've spoken to an HIV negative teen who only wanted two things in this world, to meet a nice guy and to zero convert. Now, if these people care so little about their own lives and well-being, why should I care? I should give up my Saturday night to raise money to buy drugs for some punk who went out and got AIDS thinking it was cool. I should sign posters and theater programs for auctions to pay for the treatment of someone who continues to have unprotected sex, spreading the misery? Should I waste my time and energy fighting to keep the infecting of others with HIV decriminalized and a private matter? Why waste money buying condoms to distribute when I can't even get some of my own acquaintances to have safer sex? Shouldn't I forego all this goody-two-shoe crap and just let the next generation fester on drug cocktails and slowly die. Why not? My generation has struggled and sacrificed all of these years, and we've made little difference. Why shouldn't I stop wasting my time? Or have we been fighting the wrong cause of this epidemic all along? Have we? I may be ready to join those nutcases who claim HIV does not spread AIDS. No, I don't blame AIDS on government testing or biowarfare. I believe AIDS is spread by the same killer virus that has stalked and destroyed our people for as long as we've existed. 
Forget silence equals death. How about self-loathing equals AIDS? Simply stated, happy people don't hang themselves, do they? I'm Bill Brocktrop. From all of us at In The Life, we'll see you next month. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation, the Gill Foundation, the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, the Overbrook Foundation, the Ted Snowden Foundation, and the annual support of In the Life members like you.